So I think people are probably entering into our watch zone right now. And I guess I will welcome everybody. I'm Stuart Harodner. I'm the director of the UK Art Museum. And I'm very happy to have tonight uh, artist Patrick Smith from Lexington, who has an exhibition here that I'm sure many of you uh, have seen. And if you haven't seen, it's up for a little while longer, um, up until April 3rd. <clears throat> but when we do exhibits, we always like to give a chance for artists to have, a ch have an opportunity to tell, the, tell you, tell uh, interested parties, art lovers about their work from their own point of view and try to get behind the making of things. So I'm very happy to have Patrick here uh, to have a conversation, casual conversation about some of the ideas behind his work and the motives, my motives, for pairing his work with a series of prints, mezzotint prints by the artist Victor Hammer. So let me first just welcome you, Patrick. Hi, um, hello everybody. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, I guess I should say a little bit about the motives behind the exhibit, just as a brief intro. Um, and Dan, maybe we can pull up my colleague, Dan Solberg is the sort of magical person behind the scenes, helping us with images and uh, flow of information here today. So thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> and I would suggest that folks, as they watch uh, the conversation, listen to it. Uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there is a Q&A uh, tab there if you want to post any questions. Uh, Patrick and I'll probably chat for about, you know, 30, 40 minutes and leave some time towards the end for questions that you may have. So please, you know, put those in as they come to you and we'll address them sort of towards the end. So, um, yeah, I guess we're starting here with the image, a visit to storage with Patrick holding the work that really started all of this um, exhibition plan. And um, Dan, can we go into uh, some installation shots? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so the exhibit title, this is a show that I curated, uh, it's called Face Off. And the motive here was to try to not only uh, exhibit Patrick's paintings on paper, but try to give them a, a kind of historical context, try to give them a, um, uh, a subject matter and technique uh, uh, foil in, in a way. And so what I decided to do was to uh, invite Patrick to show work with the notion that we would pair his works with works by Victor Hammer. And just a brief, since uh, Victor Hammer is long deceased, I'll tell you a little bit about him just as a way of setting this up. Um, so Hammer was born in Vienna, Austria in 1882. Um, he studied there at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. He studied in Italy, in, in Florence, in Rome. Um, he really, inter interestingly, was a kind of 20, you know, he was a, uh, an artist who was in the context of the Vienna Secession, uh, an art movement and, and time in Europe where his peers would have been people like Gustav Klimt and Egon Schiele, uh, artists who were at the, you know, kind of forefront of the beginning of modernism. Um, unbelievable stylists, figurative stylists, as we know. And, um, but Hammer was really not interested in being a part of the art moment that he was born into. He really was much more interested in uh, religious art uh, from previous centuries. He really kind of fancied himself an artist of the Renaissance, really, uh, in terms of his level of skill, his interest in being a kind of artist who worked between design, he was a typographer, interested in making prints, drawings, paintings, all of them unbelievably realistic, but very much with a kind of uh, point of view from an earlier time. Um, he pictured many of the friends uh, in his social uh, group, he was painting, and you'll see shortly, uh, and drawing and making prints of people who were diplomats, who were uh, figures who moved in the sort of upper echelons of society. Um, 
eventually uh, he fled Vienna, fleeing the Nazis in 1939. Um, eventually, he settled in Lexington in 1948, became artist in residence at Transylvania University. He designed the official seal of Louisville and the seal of the University of Louisville. Um, he married Carolyn Redding in 1955, who was the founder of the King Library Press here at UK. And... Um, lived here until he died in 1967. Um, and the museum is you know, lucky to have quite a few works by Hammer in the collection. And um, my awareness of Hammer, his unbelievable skill in rendering and working at a relatively modest scale was something very much in my mind when, when I came to think about wanting to show Patrick's uh, work. Um, I think that's sort of enough to give you a little bit of a sense of what my motivations were. Um, certainly, we could have done a solo show by Patrick. He certainly is worthy of having a, a solo museum show here at our institution. And many of you may know that concurrent with this face-off exhibit is a show at Institute 193 on Limestone Street uh, which is a solo show of other recent works by, by Patrick. So it really is a moment um, for looking at his work. Um, and maybe I'll just jump in with a question for you, Patrick, about how it feels to have this work on view, either here and at 193. What does it feel like as a you know, practicing artist in Lexington to be visible in this way right now? Well, for me, it's, it's difficult for me to uh, not think about what I'm learning from the experience. I'm, I, I go to my shows and it's, it's just like me uh, evaluating what ideas worked and what ideas didn't work. It feels kind of like a football coach watching the tape of the game. So I'm still looking at the pieces and thinking, oh, I had no confidence with this particular idea, but it ended up working really well. And this other idea I thought was surely going to be good and it's not really what I thought it was going to be so it's I really love having so much of my work up in different contexts at once because I'm able to get a tremendous amount of information for what I want to do going forward and um, what I'm really good at and what I need to focus on well let's let's uh, let's look at the works that are on view right here now uh, we have a slide that pairs on the left, self-portrait in fur in 2018, with a portrait by a portrait by Hammer of Albrecht Graf von Burstorf, 1926. This is a mezzotint print. Uh, it's a very painstaking printmaking technique. Uh, it really is about building up the grayscale uh, in terms of the print, and that level of subtlety that you see there is um, quite remarkable, really. Both of these works are about the same size as you saw from the previous slide. But um, by way of starting how we came to do this exhibit in the first place, um, I acquired the work on the left uh, personally from you and then donated it to the art museum. Uh, I'd been looking at your work for quite a while and feeling like we should certainly have something of yours in the collection. Um, and I'd seen this work for a few years but you posted it on social media easily a year or two after you made it. And I kind of re-saw it. And I must say also that in that time frame, uh, my father passed away. And I started to think that I should buy this work and donate it to the art museum. Um, uh, I came to have be flush with a little bit of resources and I thought, well, I'm gonna pay it forward and, and buy this work. And then it really dawned on me in thinking about my dad at the same time, that this level of skill that you have, this level of kind of realistic rendering, um, my father, who was a Sunday painter and photographer, really was quite enamored with artists who could pull this kind of realism off. And so it felt to me very much like, not only should we have a work, which was the first thing that your career and development warranted that, but then secondly, I thought, well, this would be a good thing to do and, and do in the spirit of a, a kind of thought of in memory of my father. 
but it's the power of that gaze that's really amazing. You know, um, the, the vulnerability, I think, that you express. And of course, it then seemed really interesting when I noticed that the Hammer print was almost like a separated at birth relationship to your self-portrait. Can you talk a little bit about making this, about yourself? And there's another self-portrait in the exhibit. Can you talk about what it's like when you paint yourself or when you decide you're going to do a self-portrait? Absolutely. I think something that um, a lot of figurative artists who do portraits have to deal with is for a long time when you first start working, all of the portraits look like yourself. Right. That's like I've heard that thing about how um, Rembrandt, some of his less successful portraits, they just look like self portraits. He didn't really capture the other person. Um, so I, I was really for a long time trying to get away from my own likeness, how my ethnicity, I'm Lebanese, 50 percent Lebanese. So I have certain facial features that really don't come forward in a lot of um, European looks. So I've worked really hard to be able to not put myself in other portraits. So when I started doing portraits of myself, it was almost extremely easy. It was almost like um, this very familiar thing that I'd been battling to avoid. All of a sudden I could do one. And because of that, it's extremely fun doing self portraits for me. That one in particular came together very fast. I was, I remember there's on, you can look on the, the shadow side of the face. There's this vein on the side of my head or some kind of undulation on the side of my forehead. Yeah. And it was a, a moment that people like in, in painting where it's like, a, you see this in Velasquez a lot. There's like a single brush stroke when you look up close, but then from a distance, it looks very realistic and rendered. And when I was doing that piece, that was, that just kind of kept happening. It's something that I think all painters strive to do. I definitely strive to do it. And so I have just very happy memories of making the piece because it came together in almost an instantaneous success. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the, I mean, you know, it's like, you're not wearing a shirt. You're, you're, you're in black fur. There's a kind of very delicate, very, you know, I said vulnerable earlier, but there's also a kind of, subtle sexiness to the feel of the thing. I mean, can you talk a little, and of course it's, it's based on photography. That yes. The work that you're, you're, you know, things we're seeing in paintings uh, are the result first of a, of a sense of photo shoot, right? Absolutely, yeah. It's um, all, it starts with a photo and then I, I, I work from the photo. I, I'm not standing there in front of a mirror drawing myself and painting myself. Um, as far as as far as costuming goes, I I um, was working with a friend who's taken several photos of me, and I, I was basically just going through her closet, putting on whatever would I could get, and then seeing how it looked in a, a picture. And it was a situation where that that particular fur coat didn't fit me at all. But if you took a picture from the right angle and cropped it in a way it looked like it was made for me to wear and the way that it contrasted with the light hitting my body had just a real power to it i personally felt good wearing the thing i think that's mm -hmm. something that happens when you costume and it's it's really important to not forget that if you if you wear clothes that you feel good in it your your, your smile looks different your face looks different so there's a lot of method acting that goes into my work i would like it all to be as real as you can get. I mean, obviously with some, there's a degree of fakery that has to go into a work of essentially fiction, but I'm not going to pretend that I can make a certain type of face or portray a certain kind of emotion without putting in, getting into character first. So the fact that I'm with a friend who we're gonna have a very good time, who is, who thinks that I look good, who is excited to work with me, and then I'm wearing clothes that make me feel a certain way I think it all comes forward in the picture it doesn't seem it doesn't seem fake a lot of people give me the feedback that it feels authentic to them and that's because it largely is authentic mm -hmm. yeah let's let's move to another another pairing and I think we can continue to see some of this happening um, I guess we're looking here on the left uh, 
painting of yours of uh, subject whose name is Nadine. Um, and if we cut back for a second, Dan, that image is, is cropped here um, just so we can see. And this was one of the, I think it's one of the most amazing things about this uh, portrait is that hand holding that glass. Um, and again, this kind of very sumptuous uh, fur. Um, can you talk about who your models are a little? Well, where, this, where, you know, who, who comes to be posing for you? Sure, absolutely. Um, this particular person is a friend of a friend who I had just met at social things. And we had a lot of common interests. Um, we liked similar TV shows. We liked similar foods. So, and I also liked how she looked. So I asked her and I had noticed that she uh, um, enjoyed taking photographs of herself, was often in pictures, looking very good with good makeup on. I had asked her if, if we could work together. She said it was a good idea. Um, so we, we decided to just make an entire uh, day of it. And actually at the time I, I took this picture, she had been in a very bad car accident and was basically unable to walk. She was using a wheelchair and could kind of scoot around. So we were limited in the type of poses we could do, but we still wanted to, you know, we didn't want to abandon the shoot. We didn't want to feel like it was something second rate. So I thought, okay, well, let's do some kind of very seated, almost Odalesque type of type of routine. Mm -hmm. And we just went around her apartment and found various things that could look good in this. And she happened to have that martini glass and happened to have that fuzzy blanket. And that's how the picture began. So of course, one of the fun things about the show is pairing your work in this case of rather, you know, kind of a quiet sexuality or a quiet kind of uh, seduction maybe that has this, the, the image has. I mean, again, most of your, your portraits, the, the person is sort of meeting your gaze. They're looking directly at you, at least in, in, in the ones that we've got here. And that's one of the things that I think gives the work this very intense, intimate quality like the presence of the view. Um, and in the case of the, the pairings with the Hammers, the Hammers are often um, much, much more formal, a little bit stiffer, a little bit more, you know, um, presented to be in public in a way, you know. What did you, you use this phrase when you were at the gallery that I really loved, which was this, what was your description, the front of house? I, I called Victor Hammer um, business in the front and my work party in the back. <laughs> I love that. And the, and the pairing certainly play that out uh, quite a lot. But um, maybe something that's sort of like a really, you know, simple question to ask, but might be fascinating for people. Um, because the works have these unbelievable levels of, of realism and detail, uh, people who see the work often tell me in the museum, they just can't quite believe how realistic they are, the kind of subtlety, the abrasions on that, on that uh, blanket, the glint of light in the glass. Um, how long do you work on these works? I mean, they're pretty small in scale, but that doesn't mean they come off quickly. Well, I'm, I'm constantly trying to find a balance between how long a piece takes to make as far as like sheer number of hours and trying to paint in a way that is efficient because you don't want to overpaint. If you get the, you start to lose some of the vitality of the medium if you're just painting and layering and caking and caking and caking. However, certain textures like that blanket, there really is no good way to make that in any sort of efficient way. So that piece in particular is probably the most laborious thing I've ever made. I mean, the blanket itself, I felt like I had to put together almost strand by strand to recreate that texture. And I became obsessed with it and decided that I just absolutely had to get this thing right. And of course, by the time I was done with the blanket, I had ended up inventing all these ways to make that texture that I had no idea how to do when I first started the blanket. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, part of the mystery of how my paints paintings come together is because there's lots and lots of thin layers. And sometimes you have to think multiple layers ahead. So you might put some white paint on a little thick, knowing that when you layer blue on top of it, the blue isn't going to adhere to the thick part as much as it adheres to some of the thinner areas. And that can reproduce a texture. Artists have used those sort of techniques forever to sort of get unusually textured things that wouldn't look as good if you just kind of painted them by number. You have to kind of fabricate them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's mysterious to try to have your brain understand a 20-step process. Uh-huh. Did you learn this level of craft in school? Is this pretty much something that you came upon after school in terms of self-learning? Yeah, this I didn't learn any of this in school. I um, This is completely something that I, I cooked up in my studio with trial and error. And really it, it started just as an experiment to see if I, if I even could paint stuff realistically. And then I trial and errored my way through having more of a thought out process where but when I go into these things now, I really know what my first layer, second layer, third layer and so forth is going to be before even starting them. And then from piece to piece, I'll make little tiny tweaks, such as, well, maybe I'll put the blue on before I put the red on when I'm layering this particular thing, and then I'll evaluate which one looked better. I know it's it's hard to explain because it's there's so many layers, and I'm so familiar with it that making tweak. Anyway, go ahead. No, um, if we move to the next image, I want to sort of go uh, to a question about, you know, history and painting history. So uh, one of the things that I know from discussions with you is the degree to which you are looking at historical painting, art of the past. And of course, the work on the left here, um, uh, the subject or the title is Armani. Um, and this, you know, this man kind of feeding himself uh, a bunch of a bunch of grapes, you know, certainly in museum art history land, you know, reminds us of Bacchus, the kind of Greek, the god of debauchery and and drunkenness. And um, again, an unbelievable painting in terms of detail. But also, I'm interested to you to talk a little bit about your connection to art of the past, what you look at. Um, what's inspiring to you, any particular artists who really have been helpful in creating the kind of work that you make now? Absolutely. I, I'm, I love um, art from really all centuries. And as far as the work that I like to make the most is reminiscent of what you would see during the 1500s and 1600s in you know, Italy, the Netherlands, Spain, I guess, France to a certain extent. It's kind of the high classical Renaissance era of painting. Um, That's the type of work that I have the most aptitude for making. So that's what I spend my time doing. And I spend a lot of time uh, studying that stuff too in in books, which you can do to a certain extent. But then when you, you get to see it in person, I've painted enough that I can look at one of those things and see how they fabricated it. And sometimes it's absolutely kind of mind boggling because whole studios of people back then would work on one painting. So it's not really a one-to-one relationship for me doing it. I'm a lot of times they would, you know, hire out a leaf specialist, for instance, to paint all these elaborate floral floral things. I'm I'm never going to be able to do that. But then in an artist like um, Vermeer, who I really like to look at, um, he, he did those all himself and it, there's a lot of idiosyncrasy in the pieces. So I, I like looking at those and seeing how he did color, where he chose to use certain pigments, where he chose to use other ones. It, it's informed how I do things to a certain extent, but at the end of the day, I'm using acrylic on paper. So there's a lot of stuff that I see in Renaissance work that I love that I can really have to find a totally different way of getting similar effects. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, Michael, well, at least you, this, in this regard, you and Hammer actually, you know, are quite similar in your in your adoration for you know much earlier periods of art and and feeling like those periods are, you know, unbelievably generative in terms of the kinds of work you want to make uh, in the in the now. I think it's one of the things that gives your work this very um, all time feeling. Like it feels like it's con contemporary because it's being made now, but it has a, the, some of the kinds of people being pictured um, uh, feel totally contemporary in terms of tattoos and piercings and uh, things which code us into the fact that we're in the late 20th or 21st century, certainly. Um, but much of these other qualities give it the feeling like we could be looking at an artwork that got plucked out of a, you know, a century or two ago. Um, let's move on to maybe the next pairing. Um, and again, you're seeing a little bit of my sense of joy of the putting things that feel uh, somewhat stayed in the, in the Hammers and the Hammer portraits. Again, for the most part, we're looking at people who were, you know, diplomats, professors, uh, governors, people who are, um, you know, in charge of institutions, uh, political figures. And people who were living as, you know, Hammer was in this fraught time in the 20th century. Um, but I just love the degree to which the people that are posing for you, and this is Alexis, um, that the body position, the even when figures are laying down, and there are several of those in the works so at 193, um, the figures are still looking up at you, but also now in this case, the viewer, us. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the making of this one, for example? A absolutely. And maybe the degree to which you, you know, kind of deal with, how do you deal with foreground background? You know, the sense that you're not trying to put people in maybe a more recognizable space. They're, they're often in a kind of all space, a kind of voided space. Maybe talk a little bit about some of those decisions. Sure, I, absolutely. I, I can actually tie, this is a very recent piece. It's the most recent piece in either show. It's, it's one of the very, um, before these shows launched, it was one of the last pieces I finished. Um, and to tie this back to what we were saying previously, I had gotten a chance to see this great Caravaggio painting up close in Kansas City. And I was amazed at how little paint he actually put on the canvas to get the effects and a lot of the background was just basically the the first layer of brown on the canvas that he just let kind of not have a lot of detail or a lot of um it didn't draw your attention it was it was just kind of nothing and that inspired really me to try to see how minimal i could be making these pieces and making backgrounds that don't really have a whole lot of distraction in them. They're just kind of there to accentuate the figure. So this piece would be an example absolutely of that where there's a shadow, she's kind of in it. There's a big foreground and her body is also cropped kind of completely off the page. And the, the reason for wanting to do that is I, I see these pieces as kind of a still from a movie that wasn't necessarily made. So I don't want to tell anybody what the movie is and I, I don't ever want that story to be known, but I want there to be a sense that something happened and this is part of a cinematic event. So I think what really accentuates that is having kind of as much mystery as possible. So the more Im implied mystery you have in the piece, the more people can use their imaginations to come up with what the piece really means for them. It just, it kind of, makes the viewer think a lot about what's really happening here, giving the absolute bare minimum of clues, which is something I like to do um, in artwork. It's something I like other artwork that does that. And I think that's mm -hmm. something that I'm able to do. That's like, I can successfully pull that off. So I've chosen to go in that direction. And yeah. then with her looking at the viewer, it kind of breaks the fourth wall a little bit. So the viewer is all of a sudden part of the scene, but it's, you're not really sure what the scene is. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a, a dream or something in that, in that sense. Yeah. I mean, it's really 
and also because of the scale, you know, for the most part, we're talking about works that are like smaller than a foot by a foot, you know, for the most part. And in each case, you have to come into, you know, the works kind of beckon you. They don't really reach you. They don't reach out to you. They kind of go, come here, and you're, you're getting closer and closer, puts you in a very kind of intimate viewing mode and when you do compositions like this it feels even more intimate especially when the person is unclothed they're they're laying down i mean this could be you know lover partner family member people who we see in these kinds of positions bodily positions um so we get you know we get quite into that that act of looking and the person is aware they're being looked at, as opposed to this work here with, you know, by, by Hammer, where the subject is kind of, the interesting thing I think about it is that the subject, his gaze is completely, you know, off camera, off, off view. Although both of you are dealing with the spatial location of the body in a similar way. Like look at how both of these figures are put into space just by that subtle, arrangement of where the light is coming from and where darkness happens. And is there a transition? Um, I just really love seeing these things together, of course. Um, let's move to the next one if we can. And again, here we have this very, you know, the figure on the right is the sort of, uh, as I'm remembering, the uh, former governor of Staria, a, uh, you know, European state captain um this very formal you know head, head head headwear and feather and collar and tie and another self-portrait here by by you which is um you know about as different as the self-portrait in fur as we as we might be able to pick um now let's talk about fiction you said fiction a little bit earlier you don't have these tattoos um, I, I do. That's actually someone else's arm. Ah, good. Okay. You, okay. Then there you go. That's interesting. Yeah. I, that, this one, um, that's someone else's arm. And then the tattoo in the foreground is mine. Okay. The one on your arm. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I almost never read that initially as another person's arm, but that gets even more psychologically complicated and yeah, maybe this... more filmic as you were just talking about. Absolutely. It's this piece. I, and you're not the first person. I mean, I think every single person who has seen this piece, I've had to say that that is someone else's arm. Can you talk a little um, bit about how that, how this, how this one came to be. I mean, obviously if you're posing in these, then you absolutely. have quite a lot to say about, you know. Um, well, I'm, I'm realizing now that I, this is almost a cliche. I, I believe Stephen King is often in his own movies as the person who gets murdered. I think Alfred Hitchcock was someone in his movies getting murdered. This is like directors of movies always want to put themselves getting killed in their own film. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. I wanted to do a, um, a kind of violent um, self-portrait getting murdered or, or maybe I'll survive after an emergency room visit, but I wanted to do kind of me on the wrong end of violence, self-portrait. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to be honest, my, my personal life, I don't experience anything violent ever, except on television where I'm watching violent television constantly, especially true crime. And I, I think that the inspiration from this came from watching hundreds of episodes of the forensic files and then thinking, they, they always take these crime scene photos and it's like, they're not trying to make something that's a fine art image, but they're just, they're trying to document something thoroughly and it ends up having this real power to it. So I thought I'm going to try to do something like that uh, for my self portrait and, and you get this piece. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. There's this, if we go back to the, to the close up again, there's something I always like to think about in painting, although it comes more traditionally from commentary about photography. Uh, you know, the, the, the writer uh, Roland Barthes talks about 
this thing in a photograph, what he calls the punctum, which is a detail, a small detail in a, in a sort of larger photograph that catches your eye and maybe becomes, you know, like, it seems oddly like it might not be the most important thing, but it becomes a thing where you realize, oh, wait, that has a, and that word punctum, like to be punctured. It's like the thing which punctures your awareness. And I can't, you know, stop, and obviously with all the tattoos to look at, there's something unbelievably weirdly interesting about that black painted fingernail. Mm, yeah, yeah. And where it is in terms of your covered eye and its blackness relative, not just to the blackness of the background, but the sort of seemingly leather outfit that you're wearing. Um, it just feels unbelievably <laughs> important. I probably would keep going to it and then it, excuse me, connects, <coughs> excuse me, to the blackness of your eye or the blackness under your teeth. Like they're really quite unbelievably orchestrated in terms of small details and things that move your eye around the image. How, how conscious are you of all those things at the moment of making these pictures? Oh, extraordinarily. I, and part of working in a cinematic way is that I like to take, I mean, hundreds of, of source images that are even kind of something that would seem like the same picture. I mean, I'll take 50 pictures that are all nearly identical and then spend months looking through them on and off. I like to, you know, look at them, wait a week, look at them, wait a month, look at them again, and really determine what characteristics a source image has or needs to have in order to kind of do what you're talking about with the fingernail and the eye being in kind of a dance with each other. So I'm, I'm really, really um, going to absurdly neurotic lengths to try to get that stuff to line up in every piece that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it really does operate. I haven't seen, you know, works of yours in the last few years that all don't have this kind of very orchestrated compositions, very clear choices of color and background or, or where images come in, where bodies are cut, where they're cropped, where they, you know, you're really doing it, man. Can, Thanks. Can, can we shift back maybe to just talk mode? I mean, we're, we'll sort of shift away from the images. Um, these are some other images of Hammer there. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you maybe one other question or so before seeing if others have some questions, which is you're pretty active on social media. You've posted works in progress. Um, you're, you have the kind of audience that follows what you do in terms of posting. Um, can you talk a little bit about either generationally or predisposition to using social media as a way of keeping an interested audience kind of with you is almost like making your studio a little more available because you put stuff up in process and you put stuff up when you finish. And certainly a lot of people know you through that. So uh, what is the value of doing that? What do you get out of it? Okay, that's a great question. I, um, primarily on social media, as far as art is concerned, I like to keep people informed of what I'm working on. And I like to have the overall um, kind of vibe I'm going for be something inspirational. Um, I, I try to show work that's my work in general is made with very accessible materials you know my studio materials are, are basically just acrylic paint and paper that you could buy at a michael's i use mechanical pencils to draw so i i like to show people that there is the craft um while it's it's somewhat rare in the united states to see people that spend their free time doing and developing levels of craft it's, it's totally possible, it's, it's accessible, it's a worthwhile act activity. And I like to, I like to show people that, um, you know, when you make this type of artwork, it, it really is a process and you have to put a lot of time in, but at the end, things can slowly gel together and look like this, this piece that's, in, that's impressive. 
uh, I don't like trying to sell stuff online or monetize anything because that seems to be a um, runaway train into becoming an artist to dollar store kind of fusion. And that's not what I'd see my work as at all. Um, but if I could increase even incrementally the Lexington public's interest in fine art or even craft or even hobby and draftsmanship, like something your father was interested in, I would consider that a huge success. Um, that's pretty much how I view social media. Occasionally I try to be funny on social media and then there's the unavoidable political rage moments we all have, but I try the best I can to mix those up with some kind of humor um, because it's, you know, you're not really yourself on social media. You're an avatar of yourself. You're kind of representing yourself and it's, I try to not be super personal, but at the same time, tell people useful information about what it's like to actually be an artist and be developing work. Yeah, I think you're actually, you're, I think you do that. I think you do that on, on you know, Facebook for sure um, and Instagram. And, and, you know, it's like you're taking people along. Uh, you have a series right now where you're sort of looking at a, you know, kind of classic drawing from antiquity and sort of like learning and showing people what you're, what you're up to. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the works that are on view at Institute 193? I don't have images of them, but for example, the work that we showed here, Nadine, the, the, the uh, nude holding the glass, there are way more images of uh, nu uh, nudity uh, you know, uh, at 193 a little bit more full bodies and a little bit more, maybe a, maybe a little bit more sense of sexuality and identity. Um, can you talk a little bit about the works that are less portrait heads and a little bit more of the full body and including some other work that isn't on view there either, which is even now more complicated, two and three figures in the same scene. Because all of Absolutely. this is stuff that you're working on, but but it'd be worth maybe chatting about that for a second. Well, yeah, I have. Um, I'm kind of somewhat known for doing these voluptuous um, full figure female nudes, and there's there's several of those at the Institute 193 show. Uh, it the show itself has a little bit of a different vibe than the UK show because. It, it is almost entirely nudes that I've done or more sexually provocative images. Um, that being said, there's a very similar balance of work as far as stuff I've done in the past couple of months compared to stuff I, and, and also some stuff I did from a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that show is only open for a couple of more days. It closes on Saturday. So anyone that wants to see it, should go down to Institute 193 and you'll, you'll be able to see some very attention to detail, full body female nudes. Um, and a lot of people comment on the, the models that I choose for female nudes in particular are not the type of women you would see in the magazine or even the plus size Torrid catalog. I don't airbrush anything. And, and really the, reason behind that isn't to make some kind of political statement as much as it's it's a realistic portrait of someone that I know so if I airbrushed it or did some other kind of manipulations to make it look more like a magazine that would defeat the whole purpose of trying to realistically portray someone that I know uh, it would kind of go against my whole ethos as an artist that's pretty much all I have to say about that um, the larger three-figure works I don't know when I'm going to exhibit those, but I am very interested moving forward into doing works with multiple figures to tell more of a story. And that's just what I've been saying the whole time with the, the cinematic nature of work gets much more complicated when you have three or four people in concert in a single image. You can get a lot of action. And I mean, it's not even implied action at that point. It's actual action happening between the models. COVID has really put the kibosh on me working on that sort of thing for obvious reasons. But as soon as we get this vaccine, that's the direction I would like to be going in. Okay, um, that's a great, I mean, that's great information. Um, I think what I, I, mean, I could do this with you all day, but I think people join in sometimes because they obviously have 
their own thoughts or questions or get prompted by um, things that we're saying. So I'm looking in the Q&A here, and maybe what I'll do is ask, ask you a couple of the questions. Um, so Stephen has a question here. Do your work start as pencil sketches? Is the pencil sketch still visible in the final product? Yes, it starts on with pencil. I have kind of a somewhat of a shorthand of notation to know where everything can go. I don't draw any real shadow with pencil. I don't put a terrible amount of detail in. And you can't really see the pencil in the final product, but I'm sure if you looked really close or with some kind of electron microscope, it would be visible. Uh, Sherry is asking, where is the studio located? And this, you know, is well, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't really have a studio. It, I just have a, there's a room in my house with a desk and I, I work on that desk. Uh, it doubles as my girlfriend's home office. So it, it doubles as the room I take photographs in with this red background behind me. Um, but recently I've really been liking working on the floor uh, just putting down a, a piece of paper on the floor in a stable way and pointing and just working directly on that. It's been working pretty well. Um, last thing I'll say on the studio is I enjoy having a trans, a portable studio. Basically I can fit my entire apparatus into a suitcase. This has really enabled me to travel and take all of my stuff with me and produce paintings on the road. Um, I've, I think I've made some of the best stuff I've ever painted when I was actually out of my own house. Yeah. Can you, um, somebody asked, actually, Belinda Rubio made a comment here in the chat saying that she enjoyed following your trip to Japan on social media and how it influenced you. Um, anything you want to say about like the, the kind of thing that that kind of travel or immersion in a, in another culture or in another culture's, you know, foods, food world or art world? Like what, what do you bring back? Cause you're also like a foodie and a sports guy. I mean, you have a lot of things that sort of contribute to your art, maybe in not so uh, obvious ways, but all require attention to detail, patience. Yeah, well, um, people, the first time I went to Japan, um, people immediately liked my work. And I, I think that they're, doing art on paper is a very Japanese thing. So I think I want a lot of people over there with that alone. And then for whatever reason, the, the realism in it, just, I kind of instantaneously had fans over there. And then because I had fans, I ended up landing, uh, making a good friend who spoke both English and Japanese. And he started taking me around and I'm kind of so bad at being professional that it ended up working to my advantage because I just ended up staying up all night with Japanese chefs, eating and drinking, which is actually how you endear yourself to people in, in Japan, which just kind of turned, spiraled into me getting to meet more and more people that would otherwise be very difficult for me to meet as an American tourist. Um, the biggest takeaway I've had from Japan is meeting uh, multi-generational craftsmen families. I, I've told this story a couple times. I've, I've met a um, ceramic master who lived in the same house as three or four generations of his family had lived. And they had a showroom with every generation's work. And at the very, very center of the room was the oldest piece the family had from, I don't know, 150, 200 years ago. And it was a single ceramic lobster and it was kind of like the seed that grew this whole giant, robust tree. After seeing stuff like that, you have to come back to the United States and realize that you need to put a lot of work in to make anything because it's, we don't have any, I don't have any lineage whatsoever. So it's really motivated me to try to get the absolute most out of myself as an artist and try to learn from people, not have an ego about it, not, um, not think that I've ever arrived at some sort of point, because obviously in Japan, this family spent 300 years working. So how can I possibly walk away from that experience thinking that I'm too good to practice or too good to do this? Yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, I, you know, I, 
every artist that I've ever really known or worked with makes no bones about the fact that as my friend Jack Whitten used to say, look, elves don't come in here to my studio and make this work. I got to come in here and do this stuff, you know? And, uh, you know, people's practices are, are diverse, but, you know, the work doesn't make itself and, and work that requires this level of skill acquisition or skill cultivation um, isn't, isn't, you know, like if you don't do it for a while, it may not be just like at your ready hand, you know. Um, somebody asked here, Donald uh, Whitfield is asking, do you do portrait commissions? Um, occasionally I'll, I'll do a portrait commission. If, if somebody pays me enough and I also like their idea, um, but if I, if the idea doesn't seem good to me, um, then I try to avoid it because it just gets in the way of me producing the work that, um, I'm really here to make. Yeah. I think that's good. Michaela is asking, and you touched on a little bit of this earlier, but maybe we can broaden it. What artists you, are you most influenced by? And you and I mentioned, you and I had a conversation a while back with Liz Glass at Institute 193. And you talked a little bit more about maybe some, you know, you, you mentioned some uh, long ago artists, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about contemporary practitioners. And Sure, I'll, I'll mention a good one. Um, the French new wave filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard is someone I've gotten a lot of ideas from. And the, the biggest idea I got from him is I was watching the, the movie from 1967, La Chinoise. I thought the film was, was really well done. So I watched the Criterion Collection DVD with the commentary where they discussed basically scene by scene how they made it and what went into it as long as act, along with actor interviews. There's one particular scene in the movie where one character, a female character breaks up with her boyfriend over breakfast. And the breakup is seen is so realistic that you will feel like you are taking part in a breakup that you had yourself. During the Criterion Collection interviews, I learned that the couple in the scene had dated in real life, and the scene was basically a transcript of an actual breakup they had had. That Jean-Luc Godard made the decision that instead of inventing a breakup scene, he just found one, kind of, you know, changed it to fit the format of something he could film and then filmed it that that really was a revelation to me that you didn't have to reinvent things that you could actually find them in real life and then stage them with the right lighting and it's even better than anything you could think of and you have to assume that all of that information somehow seeps into and infuses the performance or gives a kind of uh, hard to know exactly why, but a, a kind of veracity that might not be there otherwise, you know, no matter how good the script or the acting is. Absolutely. Um, also, I mean, that seems like an extremely hardcore thing to do for the sake of art, but I personally like artists that take things that far. I mean, obviously you have to have some kind of like ethical lines here and there. You can't, I don't want someone to murder me on screen just for the just for art, but there is a lot of realism that like you're saying here, you can't really get the emotion or the tension unless you do that. A modern day actor that makes me think of this is someone like Daniel Day Lewis, who I, I believe there was some movie where he slept on a floor for like six months just so he could be in the right level of tension when he was acting in his scenes. Yeah, I mean, that level of, uh, you know, method, that level of immersion um, certainly, you know, he's, he's quite notorious for that kind of level of, of uh, engagement. Hey, so I happen to know that you're a pretty, you know, active uh, uh, chef, for lack of a better word, but you like cooking, you do a lot of cooking. Um, I think this is true, but can you, this may seem a little bit odd, but can you talk about any kind of parallels between making artwork and cooking the way you cook? who you cook for, what you make. Absolutely. Um, I, I cook on, you know, for my nuclear extended family, you know, parents, grandparents, and girlfriend, probably five days a week. I think there's a very similar impulse in, 
enjoying the process of something for myself, but really the end result is for other people. With art, it's the same way. I really enjoy the process of making artwork. I would do that just for the sake of doing it. But the end result of that artwork is for the general public. It's not really mine anymore. I'm just trying to make it as good as it can be. When I'm cooking, that's the same kind of idea. One of the biggest differences between when I'm painting and when I'm cooking is with cooking, there's, it, it's very relaxing for me because I, I have a total detachment of whether or not anyone thinks I'm any good at it. I actually, people are constantly trying to give me compliments for cooking and I don't wanna hear compliments for cooking because I don't, I already get compliments for art. For cooking, I, I wanna just have absolutely no attachment, no ego and just exist, exist purely in the process. So there's kind of a purity in cooking for me that I don't think I'll ever be able to achieve with art because I do kind of do that as a career too, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, I mean, you've been pretty clear with me and I think tonight and in other discussions about your, and I say this in the best way, your, your ambition, you know, your desire to be having shows and having those shows be in good venues and having the work go into collections and all of the things that are, you know, um, an extension of wanting to be a practicing artist with a, with a career, maybe not to be a, you know, kind of careerist knucklehead about it, or a, you know, to be such a driven person for all the externals without putting in the work that, you know, the studio really demands. But um, can you talk, maybe it's a, maybe there's a, there's not tons of questions. I'll ask you this maybe sort of final question. Can you talk about any feedback that you've gotten from exhibits or from showing your work that either was helpful or was surprising to you? Like, since you do want your, a public to engage with what you make and you do take that part of it seriously, what, what, what has been some of the kind of perceptions of what you make either in Lexington or elsewhere? Well, in, in particular with the Victor Hammer show, um, the positioning my work next to hammers for all of the reasons we've talked about today really elevated the qualities in both my work and his. And that really was a light bulb moment for me because I saw with that show and how beautifully you made that room that what I'm doing in the studio really only gets me maybe 70% of the way there. Having work very carefully hung and curated in the proper environment is what I need to focus on going forward, probably more than anything else, because it is a great disservice to myself if I try to ramshackle a show and then look at it. And I might even look at a ramshackle sh show and think that I didn't paint very well, but it really wasn't any painting I did. I just didn't hang it properly. So that was a real light bulb moment of the power of curation. Also, between working with uh, Your Vision and working with Liz Glass at 193, I've realized that curators are gonna see things and pairings within my work that I'm never gonna see myself. So I really enjoyed um, being able to let someone else tell a story with my pieces and create an atmosphere with my pieces and have myself not really have to think about that because that's not really what I do. Um, I'm lucky enough to get to work with great curators uh, like yourself at this point. And it's just, it's kind of a weight off my shoulders because it's just one more thing I don't have to worry about. Well, I mean, certainly thank, thank you. But, you know, curators like myself and my colleague, Janie Welker and Liz Glass and others, I mean, those of us who have been now lucky enough to, to do work with you, you know, we have nothing to do except to get excited about art. We feel like we wanna have a hand in presenting. Um, you know, that's the thing about curating, you know, that's the thing about uh, managing an institution or a gallery is, you know, you're putting your own belief on view. Um, and so we are always on the hunt for things we can believe in. And we, or at least I'll speak for myself, I, you know, I look at a lot of art, I follow a lot of art, I followed your art in its development over the last six years since I moved here. And I, and I feel like 
my understanding of it, your evolution. Um, you know, that wasn't a, hi, Patrick, I met you relatively soon after moving here, but it was, you know, five years later that we started to have a more increased discussion. And it felt like at that time, the work was hitting a stride that felt like it really needed a bigger exposure and, and some of the kinds of curatorial insight that you're, you're speaking about. So um, I would just say, you know, for, for me speaking, since I organized this little show, it feels very much like a special little gem. Um, I was as stunned by the uh, realization that you and Victor Hammer make a very interesting uh, dynamic. Um, we could go deeper into that. There's certainly other artists I could think about your work in relationship to. And that's, um, that's the joy of being, you know, in an institution like this is making relationships between works but also getting to know artists and feeling like we have a role to play in their visibility and their development. Um, we're terribly excited. I think uh, it's fun to be able to say we own the painting Self-Portrait and Fur. We've just been uh, supported with a gift from a Louisville collector, Henry Heiser, to be able to purchase the, uh, the painting of Armani, the man with the grapes. So, I mean, slowly we start to be able to have a couple of works in, of yours in the collection. We're very happy about that. And um, I guess we probably are at that moment. I just want to, you know, kind of thank you for doing what you do and thank you for being with us in this conversation tonight. Um, Absolutely. Thanks everybody. And Stuart, thanks for doing this. I, I've had a great time. Actually, well, I, I've had way more fun doing this than I, I ever thought I would have in a video interview in front of a live audience. Maybe I should do these more often. <laughs> well, I hope you have those opportunities. And everyone who joined us uh, tonight, we really appreciate you, you, know, you being here. As Patrick said, the Institute 193 show only up for another few days, our show up until uh, the beginning of April. We look forward to seeing all of you. Um, and again, congrats, Patrick, and thanks so much. Thank you all, everybody. See you, Have everybody. a nice evening. You bet. Patrick, I will see you soon. All right. Awesome, man. See ya. Take care, everyone. You too.